Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new SPSM Chat 3.0. I am your host, or at least one of five. Uh, I'm Rudy Caceres, at Rudy Caceres on Twitter. Welcome to SPSM Chat. If you're joining us for the first time, the day before Labor Day in the United States, hopefully we have a big international audience, because I'm sure a lot of people are barbecuing, but that's, that's fine, because the great thing about SPSM Chat is more than just a live stream. It is more than just a Twitter chat. This thing will live on in forever or until we stop paying for our WordPress plan, I guess. <laughs> on SPSMchat.com, SPSMchat.com. You can also go to the Facebook page and the YouTube channel and you can watch anytime on demand. Probably the best bet is to go to the YouTube channel. That way you can get like really into all the videos uh, almost since the beginning, almost since they started streaming on YouTube. So we're on Twitter slash Periscope Live right now, twitter.com slash SPSM. And before I forget, I'm going to make sure that I tw pin this tweet to the top of the page and just let us know that you can see us and hear us okay and that we're not talking to no one. Uh, the great thing about uh, this week is that we get to try out some new software, hopefully the last one. And the great thing is, is that we get to... Uh, no worries. We get to um, to add the little thing. Let's get this right. There we go. Oh my God! Yes. So we can actually see all of your tweets. We see everything. I have as long as you put hashtag SPSM on everything. So before we get too much into the weeds or before I just start rambling on, let's meet our co-host for this week and then we'll bring on our guest. Hey, Anxiety, how you doing? Hey, Em, how are you? Hi. So let's see if I can do this without breaking everything. Let's put it back on me. Let's put on my um, to -do -do nameplate. Uh, to -do -do. Hey, Krista Marie, how are you doing? Um, to -to -do -do -do. There we go. Awesome. So first off, let's get to, to, uh, there we go. Let's just do it all at the same time then. Hey, <laughs> introduce yourself at Danielle Glick. Hey everyone, Mark. Nice to meet you. I'm Danielle. Um, I, I, I'm on the East coast and I'm a working child therapist and that's yeah. Suicide attempt survivor, suicide loss survivor and that's my story on to the next one. <laughs> Marie. Hi everyone. My name is Marie, also known as Anxiety. I'm a Twitch and Mixer streamer. Uh, what I do is I am a mental health advocate and writer and I talk about mental health and focus on educate, opening education and discussion uh, on the on live platforms. Joelle. Hi, I'm Joelle Marie. I'm a peer specialist and also basically a consultant for um, accessibility. And I kind of move around in uh, disability rights uh, circles and I speak a lot for agency and choice. Yes, and we're all on Twitter as well. So feel free to follow all of our accounts except for Danielle. So don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and absent today is Hudson. Uh, he's got some issues, personal issues, but we wish him the best. And hopefully he'll be back here next week. So we're rooting for you. Hudson Harris at Mental Strategy. Go follow him as well. He's got some cool piggies and memes. So what, last but not least, and you get to have the whole screen, Mark. So. Oh, Yes, tell the whole SPSM, Universe, Galaxy, Solar System, whatever you believe in, uh, Firmament, Flat Earth, who is Mark Hennick? Well, hello, Flat Earthers. I'm Mark Hennick. Uh, I am a mental health activist, advocate, strategist, antagonist, agitator, all kinds of things. Uh, and I've switched it up depending on my mood, uh, which fluctuates depending on my medication. Um, I'm a, a suicide survivor. Uh, I speak openly about my experiences uh, as a frequent flyer of the mental health system throughout my teenage years. Uh, and I'm a very active suicide prevention uh, activist as well. And since this is the first day uh, of Suicide Prevention Month, uh, I think this is a great time to be having exactly this kind of conversation. So thanks for having me. Yes, and this is a big deal because you are the very first two-time, two-time SPSM <laughs> chat 3.0 guest. You were here last Sunday, and we had such a great talk. 
and nothing else. There were no other problems besides that, that we had to continue the discussion with the same exact <laughs> questions. <laughs> and But it's it was a great thing that you came on, and I'm glad you're on here again. Before we get into the questions, I want to make sure if anyone is on here on the Twitter chat. Hey, uh, Krista Marie, how are you doing? Um, doing her homework, that's totally fine as well. I appreciate you. Um, anyone else, if you're on there, make sure that it's uh, it's uh, updating live. Okay, cool. So we're going to get into our first question a little early just to make sure that we make sure we get everyone in because I think we got one extra person today. Or no, Where's – is Danielle still here? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So if you're watching this live, please let us know that you're here. Make sure to use the hashtag SPSM. Mar Krista Marie's doing it right. Do it right. Do the right thing. Without further ado, let's get to the first question. And that is, do people have a right to take their own life? And I kind of made these questions as broad as possible. So don't overthink it. Just there is there are wrong answers. Trust me. But but <laughs> don't hesitate. OK, we'll let you know if your answers are wrong. We will judge you if you say something horrible, horrible, horrible. But other than that, please, please, please feel free to share, share, share. Use the hashtag. And the way it works is uh, either you're replying to this tweet or you're using your own account. That's totally fine. As long as you use the hashtag SPSM, I can't stress that enough. Make sure that you reply with a1 to question one and to a2 to question two and so on and so forth there's four questions they'll come every 10 minutes all the way up until when we have final thoughts at 6 50 p.m pacific time 9 50 p.m eastern time and again if you're not able to join us live or if we come in a little late this will still live on in perpetuity on twitter.com slash spsm chat and the facebook and the youtube and the blog so Let's go to our esteemed guest and let's ask him that question. Mark Hennick, do people have a right to take their own life? Well, I'm not sure how esteemed I am, but thank you for the opportunity to speak to this question first. Um, you know, I think uh, the, this conversation has been bouncing around academic and philosophical search, uh, circles for, uh, for centuries. And at the end of the day, I think people can do uh, almost anything they want with their life. They have the freedom to end their own life. And actually, uh, from personal experience, it's not very hard uh, to do. And we see that all the time. I'm based out of Canada. We have more than 4,000 suicides every single year. Uh, there in the United States, where you, where you folks are, it's more than 40,000 a year. Worldwide, it's more than 800,000 uh, people a year dying by suicide. And those are just the ones that we're counting or, or have a best guess. It's likely quite a lot higher. Um, so people kill themselves all the time, and technically, you do have the freedom to do whatever you want uh, with your own life. Where I think we need to have an important discussion is where your rights, such as they are, uh, intersect with the rights of others. Uh, and if you can impose, uh, uh, as the conversation we're having on assisted dying in Canada, um, request somebody else to end your life for you uh, or on your behalf. Uh, I think that's where the question becomes a whole lot more complicated. Um, killing yourself isn't and shouldn't be a crime. Uh, it more often than not results from a mental illness, uh, depression in particular. And some people, lots of people actually dispute those stats, but generally speaking, that that is the case. So, you know, I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, if I have to give you one clear answer, I think my personal feeling is no, uh, that, that people actually don't because we have rights, we have obligations as well. Uh, we have certain responsibilities to society and, and I don't think that uh, enforcing our right uh, to kill ourselves just for the sake of enforcing that right is uh, advancing the suicide prevention cause at all. And let's go to Danielle Glick, who's totally not doing her homework right now. Not at all. And that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to have to say, like, jumping off of what Mark just said, I... Um, one thing that really like grinds my gears with all of this is the verbiage that we use and the fact that they say committed uh, in front of suicide because it makes it sound like it's a criminal act. Um, and I know for a while it was criminalized. Um, but I, I feel like on one hand, um, the same way that women have the right to choose whether they want to keep a baby or whatnot, we have the right to live our lives or not live our lives the way that we see fit. And knowing where I'm coming from my own 
you know, suicide attempts previously. Um, there were some instances where I was not thinking about the people in my life and the people that would have been left behind had I been successful. And I think that's something that does stop me today. But I do feel like at the end of the day, it is still my right um, to make that choice for myself. And like Mark said, also, it's, it's depression. Uh, depression, I think, is like a much bigger killer than people really understand or acknowledge. Um, <clears throat> When it comes to the topic of assisted suicide, however, um, I, I feel like I don't know how to censor myself with that stuff because I don't agree with it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. I think I'm kind of 50-50 when it comes to whether or not I believe that people have a right um, to die by suicide. Marie? Uh, I mean, like everybody else, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with this question in the exact sense of the moral dilemma that it brings, right? On one hand, you have the right to do whatever you want with your body, and it is your choice, and it should be. On the other hand, uh, again, having known people that have survived attempts and uh, myself living with suicidal ideation most of my life, uh, I feel like knowing that there is the other side of of that that knowing that you can come out and you can come through and you can feel better and live life to its fullest it's very hard to say yes go ahead if you want to end your life by suicide go ahead and do that you have the right to do that so it's 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 very tough it's very much i feel like also 50 50 for me like danielle said that like it's it's a personal bodily choice and you have the right to it. Do I wish for that to happen? And do I hope that our system can catch you in time? Or do I hope that you can get the help you need in time so that you don't feel like that is your only option? Yes. And I want to be focusing on that. Let's go to Joelle Marie. Um, we, I mean, we, we seem to be, um, confusing right and freedom. And I, I think that's important because until somebody stops us, we have the freedom to do anything. But so we don't have the freedom to take our own lives if people are stopping us. And there are many, many systems in place to stop us. And when you reveal that um, you intend on taking your own life, you are your rights are then taken away. So I, I think it's just important to <laughs> to keep in mind that no, we don't have the right and freedom to do these things because we are being restricted. We have our rights taken away. We have our privacy invaded, things like that. If we reveal that that is an intention. Um, at the same time, I, I don't think that taking one's own life is obviously the optimal um, choice in bad situations, but I think that it's not unreasonable to want to escape pain. It's not unreasonable to want to escape um, environments that are distressful and traumatic and that if we tell people that suicide is never a rational idea or choice we are completely dismissing them okay so thank you so much for all those and we'll let you get a chance we'll let you get a chance mark hennick to uh retort to any of those statements uh let's check out the twitter chat while we get a chance as well uh I'm doing all my doing all I can to make sure that people feel like they're a part of this. So let me make sure. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Um, let's give some shout outs to Amber Cannon and M. Thickling. Hope I'm saying that right. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let's. Uh, okay, so Mark Hennick, let's get back to you. Well, I, I want to um, acknowledge what, what Joel mentioned, too. You know, we can't invalidate what gets people to that point where they want to end their life. And I think personally, again, that it very often is a, an escape or a fatigue uh, of dealing with struggle. Why would anybody want to live with the types of things that often get people to the to the point to their breaking point when they're thinking about killing themselves? Of course, they they wouldn't. Uh, and people have different different thresholds. So the problems are, why are we letting people get that far? Why is the system so broken that we're not catching people way earlier on than that? And as far as, you know, the fact that, that there are restrictions on people's ability uh, to follow through with suicidal ideation, that's the way that it should be. You know, do we have the right to end our life? Well, uh, yeah, probably we do. 
but we shouldn't. And we should have as a society uh, many mechanisms in place, in fact, many more mechanisms than we currently have uh, to thwart people's efforts to do so. Uh, because, you know, locked psychiatric wards uh, have among the highest suicide rates of, of population. So you would think in a place where it would be next to impossible to end your life, people find a way. Why I raise that is because that tells me that most people who are suicidal, in my opinion, don't actually want to die. They don't want to live the way that they're currently living. Uh, and it's a human rights violation, I think, that they're forced every single day to live that way and that they've bounced around in a system, chances are, that does not serve them and, in fact, probably traumatizes them more. That's the real issue here, and I think that's the issue that we as advocates can't throw up our hands and say it's impossible to change. I think that's what we need to change. I think it's really fascinating that you brought up um, inpatient facilities. So I worked, I'm not going to name the hospital that I worked at, but I was working um, up until recently in an inpatient unit. And we had actually at this facility a very, very low rate of people who had successfully suicided. Hmm. Um, one thing that they implemented um, were a lot of safety measures. We did ligature checks about every 10, 15 minutes on every single room. Um, and we did have people, you know, on, I'm sure this is the same in every other psychiatric facility, but we were on observation with people for 24 hours to a degree, whether it was, you know, at arm's length or whatnot, people were on suicide watch and it was very, very difficult. Um, I was told the statistics at my hospital is four completed suicides in about 10 years. Um, so yes, there are methods where people can self harm and I find um, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of people were tearing apart books and taking like the um, staples out of magazines and using those to cut, but we were able to intervene appropriately at the right time and prevent further self-harm. But I do have to say that I agree with you because a lot of these people where I sat on suicide watch with these people were sitting there and telling me, I just want the pain to stop. And I don't really want to die, but it seems like it's my only outlet. And I know personally, every time that I've attempted, and I say every time because it's been several times, it was about the fact that everything was so completely overwhelming for me and I didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I knew there was, you know, a light out there somewhere, um, but I just wanted to stop how I was feeling in that very moment. And so I'm glad that you addressed that uh, because I feel like, Publicly, people have a very big misconception of what it's like to be in an inpatient facility. I've never been a patient, but I have worked in one. Um, so it's interesting to, to, to have the different perspective. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm not a, an expert on the area of research, but my from my understanding, uh, is that it, your workplace sounds unusual um, nationally and internationally mm -hmm. uh, in terms of suicide rates. Uh, not all health systems, not all individual hospitals or units treat suicide as a never event, something that should never happen. I don't think I ever recall once, uh, you know, in my seven uh, hospitalizations personally, uh, having any, you know, and being on one-on-one -on -one care um, several times, uh, having people check you know, ligature points or anything like that. And in fact, there, there were many opportunities where it could have happened. Uh, and during my hospitalizations, uh, co-patients uh, also died. So, you know, I, I think that it, there's so much, um, uh, it's not uniform across the system and that should be a real cause for concern uh, okay. that there really are no national or international standards. Uh, the zero suicide movement, for example, has been known to be very successful in reducing and, and eliminating uh, in-hospital suicide deaths. Uh, and that's very controversial within the healthcare system. Uh, there, there's fear of legality, there's fear of guilt, there's per fear of uh, professional culpability and, and responsibility. Uh, so there's by no means uniformity across the healthcare system, and, and that's a problem. So we're going to we're going to leave it there because I want to make sure we get to our second question. And before we do, let's give some more shout outs uh, again. I think going for MVP today. Hey, Krista Marie, go follow her. She does a lot of cool stuff as well, especially on suicide prevention and chronic illness. Hey, Jesse Quill, how are you? Hey, Whitey Gamer is I, I'm assuming that's one of Marie's people. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, Jesse Quill. What about thoughts with those with terminal illness have rather than... We'll, we'll get there. Don't, don't worry. We'll get there very soon, Jesse. So uh, to stay with us, okay? Uh, and hopefully you're saying well to how cool we all look right now. <laughs> <laughs> and again, hey, Kristen Marie, thank you so much for showing some love. Let's get to... Um, let's get to question number two, and that is... 
Should physician-assisted suicide include people who suffer from lifelong mental distress? And this goes uh, with the terminal illness question because in a lot of countries, not all countries, uh, more some more progressive than others as far as who they allow to have physician-assisted suicide. That can include people with terminal illness, people who are on on the verge of death, or people who have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, where it's clear that things are only going to get worse very very soon so let's go to joel marie at laz the laz the laz um should physician assisted suicide include people who suffer from lifelong mental distress um hard one <laughs> um i mean i i mixed on it i think that um you know, lifelong mental distress can come from physical or mental issues, and they can often be tied together. Um, I think that it's hard to give people a right to make decisions over their body. And then if somebody who can physically not take their own life um, can't get assistance to make that decision for themselves, are we limiting their rights? Um, I also had one other point, but I don't quite remember. So. <laughs> That's totally fine. We'll give you a second at the end to uh, organize your thoughts. Let's get to Marie. Uh, I do. Uh, this is this is a hard one that I also I at first I was like, yes, absolutely. This is because, you know, because I'm saying 50 50 on a right. Yes, absolutely. But then the more I think about it uh, and somebody mentioned in chat that, yes, if you are of sound mind when you're making the decision, well, it's hard for me to say that somebody would be of sound mind if they're experiencing severe mental distress enough to want to end their life. So that's a very hard one. I think it would have to be the same way that we determine uh, whether or not somebody uh, somebody somebody can end their life with physician assisted suicide uh, if it is a physical illness, if it is a diff like the way we decide, I'm not really sure what the criteria is that makes us, uh, that gives somebody the green light to do so right now. But there would have to be very, very like set guidelines definitely intact to make sure that the person, because they might be in distress, make sure that they have either a 24 hour waiting period to, to, to double check or some, some kind of a fail proof in place. Because again, I do believe that we can and should be doing better to help people who are on the brink of suicide instead of telling them, okay, here's a tool and now you can do it this way. So I hope that makes sense. No worries. I will get to uh, Danielle Glick now. All right, so I do feel like, okay, physician assisted suicide is something that pisses me off like crazy. Um, I do feel like it should be included. Mental distress should be included because like you just brought up, um, you know, if you're ill enough to be in any type of mental distress, knowing that you want to end your life, like that encompasses everything. And so mental illness is in our brain, which is an organ. So it's the same as having a disease organ elsewhere in your body that, you know, we, we okay, a, a person who suffers from major depression, for example, like when they're in the swing of an episode, they feel like they're dying every minute of every day. Like getting up to brush their teeth is difficult. Making food is difficult. I know I've been there. So why should I not be given the same rights um, that someone with cancer is having? So that's like one side of the whole coin. Um, but I just feel like, you know what, I really do, I want to bow out of this question just because I feel like I have to censor myself because I feel a lot of cursing coming on and I don't want to offend anybody. I'm sorry. No worries. So let's get back to Joelle Marie. Oh, um, so I, I think that, um, something has been brought up that if we make, you know, if we make it easier for people to kill themselves, that they would be more likely to, and that it might increase rates of suicide if physician suicide, physician assisted suicide is available. But I actually think that um, it can be a process where people are counseled and there are much more roadblocks. There's a longer period of time. Just having that, um, that knowledge that you are able to make that choice can actually make a big difference. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, we, we say a lot 
about um, the people who are left behind, but I think that constantly using that as a reason to to not kill yourself is the wrong reason. I agree let's, with that. Let's go to Mark. I do agree with that. Uh, thank you. You know, uh, contrary to uh, most of the other panelists tonight, uh, I don't find this question particularly difficult uh, personally, uh, and I feel no particular compulsion to censor myself either. Um, but I think that uh, Canada is a good case study in this uh, in this question because we have uh, physician assisted dying. We have for the last several years, and it explicitly excludes mental illness as a sole factor. Uh, what that means is that I don't believe that mental illness uh, should be an exclusionary factor if you otherwise qualify for physician-assisted dying. For example, somebody is dying of Lou Gehrig's disease, of ALS, uh, and, uh, and their death, according to the legislation that we have in Canada, is naturally foreseeable, uh, that it's going to happen and nothing can be done to prevent it. Uh, so if nothing was done, in other words, they're going to die because of their illness. Uh, if they also had a mental illness, then no, I don't think it should exclude them from the legislation. However, if they didn't have any other naturally foreseeable or, or condition which led to a naturally foreseeable death, uh, then mental illness alone should not be uh, a factor to end their life for a variety of reasons. Uh, some that I've already mentioned that they've probably, the, the treatment system has probably failed them. Uh, they probably haven't had access to the same kind of options that people with cancer, for example, have had, or, or any variety of other illnesses. Also, from a scientific perspective, uh, chances are somebody with a terminal illness has reached the limits, scientifically speaking, uh, of what treatment can do for their illness, that, there, that there's nothing left, there are no other options. That's generally not, the true, not true in cases of mental illness. Recovery is not only possible, it's actually expected and likely, uh, according to the research, when people get the type of help that they need, uh, as much as they need uh, for as long as they need it. I think everybody on the, on the panel tonight would uh, realize and, and certainly agree that nobody really gets that. And that's the problem. That's why the mental health care has been the poor second cousin of the health care system for so long. So if we want to talk about equality, we need to start there. We need to actually make the two systems equal uh, and then see uh, where that gets to us. But I would be completely uncomfortable uh, administering uh, or, or, or asking for uh, physician-assisted dying exclusively for mental illness uh, when that person has been so consistently uh, failed uh, by the system. I got something to say. <laughs> um, Go for it. Yeah. What, what, I, I, I watched this the amazing short documentary by The Economist of all places called 24 and Ready to Die. I'll try to link that below afterwards uh, in one of the tweets and use the hashtag SPSM. It is amazing because you have this young woman who is, I want to say Netherlands, one of those countries. Yeah, I that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so she's 24, has lived with just horrible, horrible despair her entire life, been diagnosed with all these mental illnesses. And like, she just wants to die. She is so committed to wanting to die that she's willing to go through this whole process. Like everyone at first is saying like, no, you're like, you, you're only 24. Like, why would you do this? And finally, she's able to convince her doctor, her loved ones, especially her closest friends, ex which is very little, accept it. And are like, if this is what you truly want, then please, 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 we don't want to keep you from from not suffering anymore and continue this despair that seems to be never going away despite all possible efforts. And the thing that blew me away at the last second, because they give you like a thousand times to ask you if you really want to go through with this with the doctor. And at the last second, she said no. And one of the reasons was, is that she, for the first time, she felt like she had a choice. She felt like she had agency. She didn't say that she might never consider it in the future, but I thought that was very, very powerful, and it's something to consider. I'm not saying that this is the proof that people who have this kind of lifelong despair should take their lives, but it's something that you should all consider and come to your own conclusions at. And so I'll try to tweet that as fast as I can um, when someone else is talking and I should be listening. So let's get to question uh, before that. Let me see if I can try to put the uh, okay, here we go. Oh, I so 
Sorry. No, yeah. I, I got the I have the video up, just letting you know. Oh, awesome, awesome. If you want to tweet that and I'll retweet it under okay, I'll retweet that under the SPSM chat. Um so I think I have to scroll down on the okay. So is that scrolling on your side, everyone? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so Amber Cannon, who's also adding a lot of feedback, I believe she's in Canada as well. So thank you, uh, Marie, for tweeting that as well. I'll make sure to tweet, retweet that. She goes on, uh, she says, yes, if there is well-documented proof that a person has tried by any means necessary to heal and there is no improvement, I think they should be able to make the decision to longer suffer. Amber Cannon says a lot of fucks. Uh, that, do -do. Was me. that was what I was censoring myself for. Yes. So it's obvious that uh, we're, we're pretty lax with the language on SPSM chat. At least 3.0. Uh, Amber Cannon says, what about the suicides that are happening in the reservations, Mark? And she also says, yes, eating and getting out of bed and don't censor anything. Conversation needs to be real. I also get, Krista says, I also get stuck on physician-assisted suicide because of the whole do no harm thing. Additionally, one of my friends once mentioned that physician-assisted suicide could lead to insurance issues. Insurance companies deciding treatment isn't worth the cost and hey tk blackman um awesome person i had the opportunity to interview her for not not too long ago says i don't see why not interested in seeing other thoughts and that's in reference to question two which we just completed we're now on question three which is would more people die by suicide if it were easier to do so and i know there was some need for clarification last week shout out to desiree l stage uh for requesting that and this is uh, this is with healthcare, this is with the law, if it just wasn't, like, say, if you're reporting suicidal thoughts to your therapist or even to your friends before you know it, you're in a psych ward and things of that nature. So, let, uh, and Mark, I would love for you to comment on the reservation uh, question, uh, but we'll, we'll get, when you get a chance to answer that, but let's get to question three. And actually, let's just start with you then while we're at it. Sure, you'll have to repeat the other question that you're referring to. Yes. For me, but in in terms of, um, uh, sorry, you'll have to repeat this question for me too. Oh, is yeah, it, um, it, yes, it, I got it's you. on the screen. Yeah. Um, so, if it were easier to do so, I think the research uh, again seems to support that the answer is yes. Uh, if you look in uh, at the United States, easy access to guns, uh, relatively easy access to guns compared to other jurisdictions, other countries. Uh, and it's no surprise, therefore, that most gun deaths are uh, are, are suicides. Uh, if you have a gun in your house, I've, I've often said, if, gun, if access to guns were easier in Canada, I'd have been a goner long ago. Uh, because it's there, it's an impulse. Uh, it's hard to not think about when you have that access. Means restriction is one of the more effective ways that we have of preventing suicides. We know that it's not the only way. It can't and shouldn't be the only way. Uh, you know, bridge barricades can only be so effective, but we know that they are effective. Uh, there's a, a bridge here in Toronto where I'm based called the Bloor Street Viaduct, uh, which was the number two suicide hotspot in North America after the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, that there were, uh, you know, suicides every every few days uh, off of that bridge up until they built a barricade that's called the Luminous Vale now. And there have only been two suicides, I think, in the 15 or 20 years since that barricade was built. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that people didn't just go to another bridge instead, that there was something about that bridge. Uh, so I think that means restriction does work. If we can thwart the impulse uh, at the time, then it does prevent suicide. Now, what happens next is absolutely critical, that you have to get people the help that they need. Uh, and that comes from a variety of factors. It doesn't mean just tinkering around in their brain or just medicating them until they don't want to kill themselves anymore. It means fixing all of the other factors, the biopsychosocial factors that are lending into the suicidality in the first place. Uh, so I think we do need to um, make it as difficult as possible for people to kill themselves. So that way it prevents that impulse or thwarts that impulse, I should say. Oh yeah, and the and the, and the, que the question by uh, Amber Cannon was just, what do you think about the uh, the rate of suicides on um, reservations, which I believe would be the what we would call Native Americans, I guess Native Canadians. Yeah, and here in Canada, uh, in, our Indigenous communities are, you yes. know, 
especially in northern Canada, uh, there's a, a, a small um, community in the territory of Nunavut in northern Canada, almost the very top of, of the world, uh, where the suicide rate is 26 times higher than the national average. You know, the, the World Health Organization, the Red Cross, have identified these as crisis zones. Indigenous communities in Canada are being ravaged by astronomically high suicide rates, and it's because of a lot of the factors. Do Indigenous people have different brains than everybody else? Are they somehow being infected by different mental illnesses than everybody else? No, probably not. It's probably got something to do with the fact that they're living, that they've been forced to live in squalor, that they haven't been given agency over their own life, over their own decision making. They, you know, they're, they're, they don't have clean water to drink. They're paying $50 for a roll of toilet paper. You know, these are all the social factors that prove to us that mental illness isn't just all in your head. It's not just a matter of, oh, your brain is broken, therefore you're unfixable. That's not even true. We can fix the brain. You know, the brain changes itself all the time throughout our life. But that's not even the only factor here. We need to address the underlying psychological causes of suicide and especially the sociological ones. And you know, Mark, this is one of those things we could do a whole show on, and I mm -hmm. something tells me we might uh, in the near future. So, uh, but I that's a whole another question for a whole another show. I want to make sure we get back on track. Uh, this gets more shout outs to Randall Rex to Whitey Gamer, who says, I know that I, I think it was Washington State and a few other states which have passed assisted uh, suicide, or rather, are there any statistics yet which show any measurable difference to those laws? Hmm. That gives me pause for wanting to do more research that I will, if I can find these statistics, I will post them on the blog post for this video for SPSM chat today. So go to SPSM chat Dot com and hopefully I'll be able to look that up and post it on the blog. So thank you for the questions. I really appreciate that. So let us get to Marie back to uh, probably have to put the question back on to make sure that we're all on the same page. So would more people die by suicide if it were easier to do so? Uh, I'm definitely in the same wavelength with Mark on this one. Uh, the, the statistics from the American uh, Association for Suicide Prevention are that it's over 50% of suicides in America are completed uh, through uh, access to uh, access to guns. Uh, and I think that that's, that's an issue and not having access to them would definitely just make it that much step harder. The other thing that I'd like to cite here is that of the people so there's two pieces here on the Golden Gate Bridge. We've also uh, now set up barriers. There is somebody who patrols and watches uh, to to ensure that there are no jumpers on the bridge. And that has reduced the number of suicides by like a dramatic percentage. And I don't know it off the top of my head, so I don't want to pretend that I do. Uh, but the other thing that I want to cite <laughs> is the fact that there is a there is a number of people that have come out who are actually survived their fall from the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, and all of them, each person has come out and said as soon as they jumped they regretted it, and something like having access to a gun to me says that is something that that is something creating giving somebody access to something so ultimate that there is there's no barrier in between to be able to stop them. And yes, absolutely, uh, you might not even have the energy and you might not have the ability to do so, but somebody does. And being able to prevent one more person from not doing so, whose intention was to to end their life by suicide, who had an access to a gun, uh, you know, I would I would in a, in a moment believe that they would be able that, that they would go through with it and uh, not, not giving them access to it would definitely prevent that. Let's go to Danielle Glick, and we're already at the uh, 6.40 Pacific time, Mark, so uh, not you, Mark Hennick, but so let's try to uh, keep it quick. Um, I'm just sitting here trying to respond to people on Twitter, and all of the talk about um, bridges has made me um, kind of nostalgic about my ex who did jump off a bridge. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I no, sorry. it's it's okay. So I'm just I, if I'm a, a little short here, I'm just a little bit um, nostalgic. But I do feel that I agree with both you, Marie, and both you, Mark. I, I feel like more measures need to be put into place. Um, as I was just talking to someone about on Twitter, I do feel like environment is something that is really not taken into consideration as to kind of what pushes people to do what they do. I, I know that we put all this focus on, oh, okay, so-and-so is schizophrenic or they're bipolar, it's label, label, label. 
but what's happening when they're at home? What's happening with their support system? And, um, you know, going back to hospitalizations and all that stuff, you know, I can tell you me personally, as a therapist, I've been in therapy most of my life and I've had therapists who did absolutely nothing but make me feel worse about myself because, um, you know, going, I, I believe someone said something about the do no harm thing. I know me, I literally was just looking at the code of ethics, which I have printed out. I'm a nerd, by the way. Um, so I was looking through the APA code of ethics. And one of the things that we are bound to as psychologists and as therapists is to make sure that the people we are seeing and treating are getting the best services that we can provide for them to make sure that they are safe. And I think that a lot of times people are scared that if they open their mouth and say something about how they're feeling, that they are going to be thrown into a hospital, which has very often happened. Um, me personally, my approach is to talk to talk them through it, to make a safety plan, to make sure that they have a you know a support system around them, a safe place. Um, but I do feel like if there were easier access to means, yeah, we probably would more likely than not see a much higher rate of people dying by suicide. Um, but I also think at the end of the day, something that's been said multiple times is that at the end of the day, I, I don't feel like people really want to die. It's more that they just want their pain to stop. Um, and I think that's something that we all have to remember and just be better to each other and actually listen because I feel like people definitely do let us know when they're not okay and they are having these suicidal thoughts and being ignored really feeds into it. So that's one really big problem I find. Um, that's my answer. Joelle? Um, absolutely. More people would die by suicide if it was easier to do. Um, I think the, the well, I guess kind of related to this question, maybe it's a nuance. I don't know, I'm tired. Um, <laughs> but I, I think saying that, you know, physician assisted suicide is an option, um, saying that that makes it easier to do is, is incorrect. Um, I've said before, I think it, um, it necessarily installs um, more pause points, more time, more blocks um, before a person can actually die. And I think by doing that, um, it gives people, people, always, people will have that option. And we're not providing that option. We are actually just taking it away all the time. So when you take away people's autonomy, it makes things worse. Um, and if somebody is um, going through suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors constantly, and we keep saying, you should be getting treatment, you should be getting all these services, it's too bad you're not, we got to change that. It's very hard for me to tell somebody who is not getting treatment, no matter what they try to do, that they don't have a right to take their own life and to not acknowledge that and really validate that. So I don't, I don't think we should be necessarily pushing for people <laughs> to take their own lives, but but we have to look at reality. And the reality is a lot of people do not get treatment and that's not an easy fix. And that's people's reality. Okay, so let's go to question number four. And if any of you, any of the co-hosts or Mark Hennick, if you want to circle back to anything you wanted to uh, follow up on or complete your thought, uh, we hopefully will have like a couple of minutes towards the end. So keep that in mind. So uh, question number four, can someone be a suicide prevention advocate and also support the right to suicide? And again, if you're watching this on the uh, on Twitter, twitter.com slash SPSM chat and you're participating in a Twitter chat, Awesome. I see you. I see you all. I agree. And this is a, it's a pretty nice turnout. I was expecting everyone to be living it up at their barbecue <laughs> for Labor Day. <laughs> so I, I appreciate all of you for joining us. So reply to this tweet or reply from wherever. Just make sure to use the hashtag SPSMs. But we're, uh, for question for Q4, respond with A4. And uh, but feel free to go back and forth if you want to uh, answer uh, question number one, either because you came in a little bit late or just your thought popped into your head. That's totally fine. Can someone be a suicide prevention advocate and also support the right to suicide? Let's go back to you, Mark Hennick. We can't hear you, Mark. Did you silence your mic or did I do that? I did. Thank you. Okay, for cool. Yes. Uh, so don't I, scare I, me I like that. Say, anyway, I, I think that that would be difficult, that those two things don't go together very well. Um, but I see how people can get there. 
Um, I think it's a reflection of siloing our beliefs in such a way that they're not talking to each other. Um, and what I mean by that is that suicide prevention, it needs to be, uh, and the advocacy thereof needs to be more than just lining up ambulances at the bottom of the bridge. It needs to be more than just hospitalizing people in basement psych wards and, and putting them on one-to-one -one suicide watch. It needs to be more than all that stuff. So if that's what you think suicide prevention is, build more hospitals, hire more psychiatrists, um, strap on more restraints, uh, then that's that's not the way we do suicide prevention. It doesn't really work, to be honest. It'll stop the impulse, which is good, uh, but it doesn't actually reduce suicide rates. We, we've, we've seen that over and over. So in, in that case, I think that um, you can't really advocate for uh, assisted dying in particular or right to suicide uh, and then say, and then because you're not acknowledging all the stuff that got the person there to begin with and all of the problems and all of the issues that we need to be tackling, that's our job as mental health advocates, as suicide prevention advocates, is to advocate for the stuff that prevents suicide, uh, which is all that social stuff that, that people are, are, are failing to get. As, as far as, you know, how do you tell somebody who's sitting right in front of you right in this moment that they should have gotten access to all these services? And by the way, they still could uh, with a powerful enough advocate or with, with a dogged enough advocate, I think. Um, does that mean, therefore, that we should change uh, the system change the law, make it more make uh, suicide more accessible in the short term because we're failing them as advocates. No, I don't think it does because you can't really go back. Then it's much harder to to take those laws back later on when we figure out. Oh, here's finally this treatment. Oh, here's this approach. Oh, here's this great amount of funding that we've been advocating for for years to actually do suicide prevention right. I think that we're still a long way from doing suicide prevention very, very well, uh, but we could be, and we cannot rest uh, until we get to that point. That's our job as advocates. Let's go to Joel. Um, I do think someone can be a suicide prevention advocate and also support the right to suicide. That doesn't mean that we are promoting suicide. That doesn't mean that we're, we're telling people like, I think we need to support people's right to do what they feel is right for them, regardless. And I think that, you know, there are multiple issues that come up that make people feel like they want to escape pain. Um, a lot of it has to do with social circumstance, financial circumstance, um, trauma, and is that mental illness or is that trauma, you know, and I, I think calling everything mental illness um, because it manifests into distress is probably incorrect. And that's that's why a lot of people are constantly quoting the nine in 10 people who um, have died by suicide had some kind of mental illness. But I, first of all, that's not accurate. And second of all, um, there are so many social factors that we cannot catch that I think that not honoring people to make their own choice is going to make it worse because it traps people even more. So I don't think we should drive people to take that option, but we should always support what they feel they need to do for themselves. Marie? Uh, I honestly don't believe that uh, I can say anything that hasn't been said already very well before. And I, I just strongly agree with that. I mean, it's your right to do whatever it is ultimately you want to do no matter if it if it upsets me that's really none of uh none of anybody's concern what i think about you doing with your body and your life um but of course it's in in all my power i would love to prevent as many suicides as possible and that's it fair enough danielle glick well i was just sitting way too close to the screen um so like Marie just said, I, I can't say anything better than it's already been said, but I also do feel that it's kind of a contradictory question. Um, with Given my profession and given my own personal experiences, like I, I feel like I have just as much of a choice in doing what I want with my body as the next person, whether that means dying or getting you know a nose piercing or whatever it is. Um, but I do also feel like I can't sit here and tell someone, okay, well, I support you in taking your life while I'm literally doing the work to try and change people's minds to not do those things. I have sat many, many, many times with many, many people, and I know I'm going to be doing it for many years still, trying to get people to realize that there are better days ahead. 
and that suicide is not the answer. Um, so I, I don't, I, you know what, I, I think it's a contradictory question and I don't think that it's something that you can, that you can actually really honestly do at the same time. And I don't care if anyone disagrees with me. I just, I just feel like it contradicts. It's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm forgetting how to speak English. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's totally fine. And the great thing about SPSM chat since day one is that it's not about everyone agreeing with each other and going like all huggy. Correct. It's, this is about a conversation. This is about the leading voices in suicide prevention coming together and having a real honest discussion that is free from like censorship and free from like oh like is that's why we put out the tweet is that we assume that your views are not those of your employer organization we want people to be real to really what say what's on their mind so i appreciate it. to all of you to mark to everyone on the twitter chat and before we get into final thoughts and anything else people want to get to uh let's go back to the uh twitter chat um let's bring it up right here so it helps go back to screen um Let's go all the way back to, um, again, Krista Marie. And thank you so much, Amber. I appreciate you and all the comments that you make. Um, uh, Krista Marie, also, I love this. Uh, also, I typically don't call myself a suicide prevention advocate. I call myself a mental health advocate but just stopping, because just stopping the suicides isn't really fixing the problem. And Amber says, in Alberta, the movement is peer support work. I've seen this work. I think Joelle can attest to that as well. M says, in suicide awareness, we often try to counteract that, quote unquote, suicide is selfish. This might be hard to hear, but as someone who lives with chronic suicidal thoughts, I often feel that those who work in prevention are selfish mm, as they don't understand the immense amount of pain i'm in uh krista also says hell yes just because you have certain views on patient autonomy doesn't mean you want to see that happen and that was the uh reply to the question question four is that can you be both suicide prevention advocate and uh advocate for the right to suicide um she goes on says i support both sides fully i think this is not a black and white issue katie gordon i appreciate you so much doctor at dr Catherine gordon one of my favorite people co-host of the jedi council podcast can't say enough good things about her says yes to uh answer for uh, to question four people can try to reduce pain suffering and suicide while supporting a right to suicide people don't have to be either uh either or in their views and Amber says, we need to stop calling police on people when they talk about suicide. This does not help people talk about it. And let's end for now with M says in, uh, in response to question three. Yes, I believe that suicide prevention should take place, but only if there is quality, accessible, evidence-based treatment available. But in the end, it is someone's final decision. So speaking of final let's go to final thoughts and take this time also if there's anything else that was on your mind that you didn't get a chance to get to or circle back to please uh by all means the floor is yours each and every one of you and then we'll go back to our brady bunch finale and talk about pigs so let's go with you at the last at the last the last the last the last um sorry i i zoned out for a second i'm so sorry um so final thoughts, uh, you know, I, I think that ultimately I it's, it's my job when I'm in a peer support role to really support people for what they want to do. And and um, it's well, it's very, very hard to see people making decisions that I think are wrong, that are painful. Um, I can't make those decisions for them. And that can't stop at bod a certain point of body bodily autonomy um, just because I don't like it and I don't want to see it happen. Um, on the other hand, like, yeah, we're, we're not giving up if we're saying you have the right to do this and we support your right in expressing that. And um, we're not going to take away your other rights if you express that. So we're not giving up, but yeah, we need to acknowledge that there are so many factors and there are so many things that we're just not doing um, right up into that point of people um, trying to take their own life. and. We, it's unfair to have somebody sit and say, oh, maybe I'll get treatment in five years that will work when they don't have access to finances, to, you know, social structures and support, to um, medical insurance, to um, anything like that. And I'm babbling, but <laughs> um, I think that's it. <laughs> Marie at M Anxiety. 
M Zidi, sorry. Oh, you're f however you pronounce it, it's <laughs> quite all right. Uh, I think, yeah, I I think this has been a really tough subject, and and um, I think I've said everything I could say on it, really, because I I don't want. Uh, it's one of those things where I feel like as much as I know, I don't mo know so much more, and I don't want to say something that I know. I, if I was more informed, I probably would not say. So uh, in the end, uh, just know that you have an ally in me if, and if somebody needs to talk and if they feel like uh, I would be the person to talk to, please come by to the stream. Uh, and uh, as long as as long as you're not in a you know in a place where you're about to harm yourself or others, we can absolutely have continued having this conversation. And also, yeah, um, part, of, part of final thoughts, if you have anything you want to promote, and you have your Twitch channel as well. So I am a subscriber to Amazon Prime. So if you want to put a pitch for that, by all means. Uh, yeah, I always feel weird pitching it, especially when they're doing these subjects. But yes, uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, the schedule is on my Twitter page. You guys check it out there and find me that way. Yeah, no, totally. Um, uh, let's go to Danielle Glick. Um, my final thoughts. Um, I was just reading the tweets and I wanted to address something that someone had tweeted about the mental health professionals not really understand what people are going through. Um, I just want to say that I strongly disagree with that. We do have a lot of ethical things in place that don't allow us to tell you what our personal experiences are. And I can tell you that nine out of 10 of us chose to go into the field of psychology, psychiatry, whatever you want to say. Um, because of our own personal lived experiences or the experiences of someone close to us. A lot of people in my life have struggled um, and I have struggled myself, which is encouraging me to keep going in this field. Um, so try to be more understanding that just because we can't tell you we understand, there is a greater chance than you think that we do actually relate. Um, this has definitely been like a very heavy, heavy chat for me, but I'm grateful for everyone who tuned in. I think Mark is absolutely brilliant, so I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to hear him. Um, stay alive, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. And uh, definitely do not follow Danielle Glick on Twitch, okay? She... <laughs> I don't have her Twitch. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay so and we'll go to you mark hennick and uh, anything else uh, where people can reach you as well because i know uh, you're active on social media and you're a public speaker you're highly sought after on canadian news stations i'm just happy to be in any room where somebody thinks i'm brilliant so <laughs> that's great for me um it, it's always a pleasure for me to have these kinds of in-depth uh, especially intelligent conversations. You know, I've done hundreds of media hits on suicide and mental health over the years, uh, and you usually only get a few seconds, a few minutes to talk about an issue. Uh, with an issue as complex as suicide and and even mental health in particular, um, that doesn't that doesn't communicate much color. It doesn't communicate much detail. Uh, when really it's all about the details. The devil really is in the details. To use the cliche. So I, I'm grateful for having this kind of conversation. Uh, outside of the, uh, the the tiny little echo chamber that can be social media conversation of mental health. Uh, what I will say, just as a, a final thought on this question, it's the question that I raised, you know, six years ago in my in my TED talk, which is, can a choice be really free uh, if you think it's the only choice you have? Uh, and there's all kinds of things that get us to that place that restrict our choice, that collapse us into that dark little moment where you can't see anything outside of that uh, one option to kill yourself. That's how I felt. Um, I hope that we can all uh, come together to break people out of that tiny little place to show them that there are more options out there, even if that option is becoming an advocate. You know, I think a lot of people like healthcare providers who get into mental health, uh, a lot of people who get into mental health advocacy, suicide prevention advocacy, they do it to help others, sure, and that's why I do it, but it also helps me too. Uh, and I think a lot of us are like that, that it, if I didn't have this, you know, I have no other transferable skills. This is all I do with my life uh, is talk about mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, and it's because there was a time in my life where I had nothing else. So I hope that more people do that too. I hope more people remember that you can use your struggle. You can use your experience, that it does matter, uh, that it does impact people, that it does help people. Uh, and and you can you can turn it into a job. You can turn it into a passion. You can do whatever you want with your experience. Bonus question, is Twitter dead yet, Mark? Oh, Twitter's over. 
<laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate you. Um, in addition to our lovely co-host, but definitely Mark for coming on again after all the hula blue last week. Yeah. Um, Mark Mark Hennick is apparently my best friend, so that's why you might be wondering why I let him get away with so much bullshit. But that is the reason <laughs> why. So thank you, Mark Hennick. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone in the Twitter chat. Let's see if we have any last minute uh, comments or tweets we want to highlight. Um, Again, thank thank you so much, um, Krista Marie. She's she says also we need to point out the fact that harm can come from some suicide preventions methods too. Uh, ooh, that's another thought to really uh, sink my teeth into afterwards. So let's get back to the Twitter chat and we'll end it there with our uh, Brady Bunch finale. <laughs> um, Danielle says, as a professional in this field, I believe yes, people fear the repercussions of honesty, and I have not admitted clients to hospitals who are still very much alive. Active listening is so incredibly important amber says yep how can people be completely speak freely if cops are called when they are having suicidal thoughts they hide their thoughts and end up dying m says sorry i didn't mean to offend anyone i shouldn't have lumped all mental health professionals in one group i have had amazing understanding clinicians but there are some that to me felt uncaring and unempathetic and you know m that is totally fine like we we're, we're all having strong feelings here and if that's how you feel in the moment Please, please, please. This is the place to do it. SPSM chat. So, uh, do, do, do. Amber says, great question. I think there would be a lot less visits for people to hospital rooms if they did. Um, Krista said, would suicide rates decrease if individuals didn't feel like there were so many risks associated with disclosing suicidal ideation to professionals? And God damn it, that's probably going to be a topic too in the very near future. Katie Gordon says, final thought is thank you so much for having this discussion. I know it's a controversial topic, but it's really important. I liked hearing a lot of different viewpoints. And I think we're going to end on that because that's a, that's a positive note. I can't really play your GIF right now. So hopefully that's not anything disgusting. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> I appreciate First of all, it's a GIF, but that's a different conversation. Oh, okay. All right. So let's let's bring it home. Okay. Let's see if we can get all, uh, how many of us? Five of us. Okay. So let's wave goodbye to everyone watching on Twitter, watching on Facebook, watching on YouTube and sbsmchat.com. I really appreciate you all. I am just so relieved that we're able to make it to the end without my laptop exploding or freezing and us like wondering what we were doing with our lives. Oh, we so, need to end on a freeze frame like a, yeah, we did it. Yeah. Oh my God. That's <laughs> dude. That actually happened to me once, but whatever. So <laughs> again, I'm Rudy Caceres. You can follow me on Twitter at Rudy Caceres. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram at Rudy Caceres on Instagram, facebook.com slash Rudy Caceres. Um, you can also learn more about me and my work at rudycaceres.com, especially if you want to book me as a public speaker um, or if you want to pay me to host a Facebook or Twitter live stream show. Hey, by all means, go for that as well. So again, thank you all. And I believe I've been getting the uh, sign-off line wrong the past few weeks. So it is not keep your piggies safe. What is it, Joelle? I thought it was hold your piggies close. Hold your piggies close. That's what I thought it was too. Hold your piggies close. <laughs>